Okay, great. Thank you all so much for coming. Really appreciate it. Um, I think the first thing most everybody wants to know is like, how are you doing? You know, what's your prognosis? And it's a bit of a mystery. So uh, right now I could be, as I sit here, I could be totally cured. It's the kind of cancer it is, can be resolved through the chemotherapy, especially and the surgery that I have. So it's about a 50% chance that I could be completely cured. The other 50% chance is that if this kind of cancer progresses, and progression sounds like a good word, but is not a good word, and that means that the cancer spreads. If that happens, it is 100% lethal, and it's 100% lethal very quickly. So I just sit here in an I don't know state um, for about two years. About two years is when most of the time, if it's gonna progress, it progresses. After five years, the, the lifetime recurrence rate is only about 7%. So it's, it's, it really is black or white. Uh, it's just, it'll kill you or I'm totally safe. Other than that, if, if I'm cured, I got off really easy from cancer. Getting a diagnosis early the way that I did was incredibly lucky. That's one of the things I try to teach my kids is that if you want to keep an even keel in life, Notice when you get good luck. That way, when the bad luck and the bad times happen, then it's not so bad. You don't feel as though just, oh, my luck is always bad. It only seems always bad because you don't notice the times that you got really lucky. And this was lucky. There, I had no symptoms. No symptoms for my kidney cancer, no symptoms for my stomach cancer. The stomach cancer that I have it's mostly noticed when people have endoscopies, a tube put down your throat to see what's what. I had one of those one month before my diagnosis. The reason they didn't see it is because it's in the part of my stomach that was bypassed. I had gastric bypass over 10 years ago. The chances of it messing up my eating, basically zero, because it wasn't part of my stomach that was being used. So I try to notice my good luck. And that's what I try to teach my kids. And so that, and Jennifer's exactly right. And thank you, Jennifer, for that wonderful introduction. I really wanted my kids to have things that made my life easier, the hard times a little bit more easy to, to weather and to avoid some of the hard times. And that's kind of one of them. Once you notice your good luck, then the bad luck seems not quite so hard. If that had been the whole book, if I really, had something lethal very quickly, that would have been fine. I could have just written up these sayings that, that I've used that have helped me, and that would have been enough. And But I did have a little bit more time, and I had a little bit more of a chance. So I wrote more and more, and heard from people that had cancer in the family themselves, or cancer from a family member, that hearing what I was able to explain helped them with their own family with their own cancer, with their own understanding of it. For me, and this is really true, figuring out a cancer, all the drugs that are used for it, what's new, what's not new, how the molecular biology works, that's a Thursday for me. That's my job. That's what I do for a living. I had to write down, because I, I have a, a piece coming out for ASCO, the American, oh, sorry, the, the American Society of Clinical Oncology, CancerNet, uh, I have one coming out and I had to put down all my conflicts. They went on for a while. It, uh, it, Pfizer, AstraZeneca, Merck, Novartis, Lilly, name, a, name an oncology company and I've advised them over the last 15 years. This is just work I do. So I'm happy to be able to help people that don't know as much. They aren't in a position, not everybody gets the chance to get a molecular biology degree, nor should everybody get a molecular biology degree. It's kind of stultifying to get a molecular biology degree. It's no fun getting a molecular biology degree. You don't want to get a molecular biology degree, so I'm happy to help you and those that read through my own experience. So I'm gonna give parts of the book. We'll have a little bit of fun in the middle. Um, we'll, we'll play a little Jeopardy with people. So if you want to play Jeopardy, think about it. We'll need three people to play Jeopardy. And then we'll go through, um, through uh, I'll do some readings also with that. Sound good? Yes. All right. Okay. So this is a part, this is a chapter. <laughs> Sorry, I like this chapter. 
<laughs> not even pretending to fight. So I'll read part of this. You're going to fight that cancer. No, I'm really not. I get unreasonably irritated when I hear I'm going to fight that cancer. What's my weapon? Our language? What good to fighting, whatever that means, do? I'm not going to fight cancer. I'm not going to beat cancer. I'm not going to lose my battle with cancer either. I don't even think my good attitude or bad one is going to do much of much, at least so far as fighting cancer goes. The actual cancer fight looks like this. Oxaliplatin, the chemotherapy, is spot welding my DNA, so replicating DNA strands snarl in a tangled mess. The oral chemotherapy 5-FU, yes, there is really a chemotherapy <laughs> called FU. <laughs> the oral 5-FU prodrug is keeping new DNA pieces from being made and poisoning whatever DNA manages to copy itself despite the, despite the oxaliplatin welding. My immune system, is hunting down stray cancer cells that survived the war chemo is waging on my DNA. In three months, chest radiation will blow double-stranded breaks in my DNA, mortal molecular wounds. If the actual fighters kill every last cancer cell, then I live. If even one cancer cell lives, I die. I'm not a fighter. I'm the battlefield. Who is being reassured here, anyway? Is this what makes others comfortable, imagining cancer patients fighting on the front lines? Is this what is expected of us, expected of me? Dress up like Civil War cosplayers? Load our muskets with blanks? Stand still for our portrait? What a waste. I refuse to play the part. I'm not fighting. I'm not even pretending to fight. There is a lot of pressure on cancer patients a lot of pressure to keep up, really not to talk about it, not to face how hard it is. And that pressure, and, and it's well-meaning, don't, don't get me wrong, I understand that we want it to be better, we want it to be all better, but it, it's not all better. And there are things that we must do and we need our energy for. It's not, it's not necessarily fighting, but we, what do we need our energy for? What I need my energy for is I need my energy for being able to well, do my job. I had a, trying to keep down my job. So we had a paycheck while I was you know, dealing with cancer. I have to keep my energy to be able to read books to my 12 year old daughter. So I have seven kids. That's a lot of kids. <laughs> and a lot of advice and a lot of things that they need that only I can provide. I still have to be a husband to my wife. I, I have to be a father. I have to be somebody who still works. Those are things that need my energy. And if things turn really badly, then I need to have the energy to be the person that does the will and the person that goes and gets every last stinking password for every account that I have somewhere in the world so that they can get to whatever they need. That's what I need to do. That's where I need my energy. It's not fighting so much, it's just living. One of the things I tell my kids and really try to impart with them as one of the things to think about in life is that life if, if you're here and you're having a pretty easy time with life i have had easy times with life and i've had hard times with life but if you're here having an easy time with life i'm sorry this is not for you this is not for you there are some people here who are having the worst time in their entire life and a surprising number of people are having the worst time in their entire life. So one of the things I tried to teach my kids was treat everyone that you see as though they're going through the worst time in their entire life. So I'll try to do a little bit of that. If I'm a little bit off, I think one of the other problems with the cancer that uh, the treatment that I've had is something called chemo brain. Chemo, yeah, I know it sounds like it couldn't possibly be true, but it really is a thing. It's really called chemo brain. There are lots of papers on chemo brain. Chemo brain means I can't think as well as I used to. I literally had a person I was mentoring last week for the first time 
except a few minutes into the time on Zoom with the person I was mentoring for the first time, I realized it was not the first time. It was the second time. At least I already had a half hour meeting with the same person before I had no memory of it. I just really, I, I can't access my memories as well. I don't always hit the words that I have as well. This is a problem at times when I'm talking to a CEO of a pharma company. So <laughs> <laughs> my, my life at the best of times is jumping out of the airplane and building the, uh, building the, uh, the parachute as I go out. But you notice I had time for a little bit of trouble trying to get to the word parachute right there? That didn't used to happen. It used to be just right there. It was a little bit easier and it's a little bit harder for me. So give me a look. If I don't remember who you are, I might have remembered before. Maybe I wouldn't have, but I might have. All right, I'm gonna read a little bit more and then we'll play again. I've got a chapter I'm gonna read. I'm gonna read almost all the chapter, but we'll break it up because it's too long. This is a chapter called Hold Your Breath. This is from February of this year. Breathe in, the CT scanner orders me. If you haven't had a CT scan and you had a CAT scan at the same darn time. So it's these big things with a gigantic donut and you get in there and they push you through and it spins around and around. That's a CT scan. Breathe in, the CT scanner orders me. The CT scanner uses a recorded male voice, breathe in, is not a request. CT scanner doesn't ask. CT scanner tells. CT scanner tolerates no funny business. My sixth grade teacher in the Dalles used the same tone with me. He was not amused. I breathe in. I've built my lung capacity over years of singing and stage and in choirs. I know how to breathe in an efficient way, deep down with my diaphragm. I keep my shoulders still. I relax my neck and face. I breathe in to fill myself to the small of my back. Strength comes in speech from the deep places. Hold your breath. Today is my first CT scan since chemotherapy. This one is the big one. There are two possible outcomes. No news and the worst news. Nothing good can come of this. I've been worrying about this CT scan even though I don't expect more tumors. New tumors would have had to thrive despite chemotherapy. I figure that could only happen and Dr. Hope really had a doctor whose first name was Hope. Dr. Hope confirmed my thinking my cancer were maximally aggressive, maximally lethal if it spread. All right, we need three people to play Jeopardy. So, and I, the only thing I ask is that you actually want to play. You don't feel like you're bullied up in here. Surely there are people that like to play Jeopardy. <laughs> Okay, we got one, Aaron. Aaron. Aaron is the famous Aaron Steinke, Eisner Award winning author. Come on up, Aaron Steinke. We need two more people to play. Two more people to play Jeopardy. You can't play with just one. Otherwise, the game, not so interesting. But please, come up. I remembered Aaron's name, but I've grown up with Aaron. Aaron's my cousin. What is your name? And if you told me five minutes ago, I am so sorry. I have not told you. My name is Kathy. Hi, Kathy. Welcome, Kathy. Thank you. Everybody, big round of applause for Kathy. We need one more player. One more player for Jeopardy. Come on. We need one more. I can't let my it's wife play. My wife is Jeopardy so, background. my wife has been on Jeopardy. She's going to be on the weakest link. We call her the strongest link now. I can't let her play. She already knows the answers. She knew the answers before I did, so. I've got to choose the front row guy. Oh, Terry. Come on up, Terry. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. All right. All right. All right. So this is the first Jeopardy round, but this uh, this is all old school. So this is 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, not at 200 to 1,000. All right. Months wait, wait, for 100. How do we, how do we buzz? You, you just say buzz. Say buzz and I'll, I'll, okay. Wait, what are the categories? This one is months. Months for 100. In the Northern Hemisphere, it's the first month that falls completely in fall. Buzz. Okay, Aaron. <laughs> uh, what is November? No, that is incorrect. Buzz. Negative 100, okay. October. October, okay. Yeah, I will tell you something. You are also going to be playing against 
19, it's unfair to play against me now because my chemo brain is terrible, but you're going to be playing against 1994 second place winner on the Tournament of Champions, Jeff Stewart. Let us, you said October, October is correct. Let's see what Jeff Stewart in 1994 said. Remember he won this, the first tournament. Oh, Jeff, you said September. Oh, uh, negative 100 for September, tying Aaron's score. But congratulations, you have 100. Okay. All right. All right. $200 clue, animal parts for 200. It's the broad, flattened limb seals use for swimming. Buzz. Oh. Flipper. Flipper, you. But, oh, you got beaten by Jeff. Jeff's very fast in 1994, but he. Jeff said, What is a fin? Oh my well, gosh. That's right. it, what it, is? Well, Jeff got it wrong, negative 300 for uh, Jeff now. And you, but you got it right, congratulations. But I didn't ask the question. Oh, but it's, it's the first Jeopardy round, so we get to prompt you. Uh, in a form of a question? What is a flipper? What is a flipper, correct, correct. And you're gonna have to remind me of your name. Kathy. Kathy, 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 Aaron, Ted? Terry. 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 Uh, well. I lose, I lose. Okay, <laughs> etiquette for 300. At a private audience with the Pope, visitors should immediately do this when he enters the room. Buzz? Buzz? Yes, Kathy? What is bow? Bow is incorrect, incorrect. I'm sorry, negative three. Buzz. Buzz. Avert thine eyes? And no, not avert thine eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff rings in, beats you all, and, and says, he says, uh, he said kneel, I think. What's the right answer? I, I, I would think it's Neil. Is it Neil? I would think you're supposed to kneel, but I know. I, I that's supposed to kneel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I said stand, and I was wrong. <laughs> so I now have no answer. And sorry, you were just too slow. All right. Yes, I, I would go anyway. All right, we're going to do two more, and then we'll be done with Jeopardy. Musical instruments for 400 of a piccolo, bass tuba, or French horn, the one for which middle C is out of range. Buzz. Buzz. Uh, Aaron? Piccolo. No. What is piccolo? Oh, it is a piccolo. I'm sorry. I got it wrong twice. <laughs> okay. Okay. So yes, you got 400 points uh, there. And then finally, uh, Canadian yeah. provinces for 500 with an area of 594,860 square miles. It's Canada's largest province. Buzz. Uh, Aaron won. Uh, what are the Northwest Territories? Uh, so first of all, uh, was it a pro sorry, this is 1994, so it wasn't a province then. I don't know if it's the largest now though. So I'm mean, just put a star by you. You maybe you win and get it come back next time. Yes. Ontario. Ontario is incorrect. Uh, Jeff rings in, beats you all, and says Alberta and is wrong. Yeah. I was going to say Saskatchewan. I don't. Even okay, know. you're wrong. You're all wrong. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's cool back. A big hand for our team that you all beat. Jeff Stewart, 1994, who got everything wrong. Everything wrong. All right, continuing the chapter. Microscopic cancer can't be spotted by CT scan. The smallest tumors a CT scan can see are about the size of the BBs I used to shoot on my family's farm when I was a child. The thought of BBs drives me to memory. As much as I loved my childhood BB gun, and I did love it, I can't remember anything living I hit that really made me proud. The closest thing to an amusing living target was a huge crow which I shot as it perched in a cherry tree. I remember it because I was with a companion, probably my cousin Gary. The crow was too big to be hurt greatly by our BBs. It squawked in confusion as we each hit the bird several times from behind our cover, behind the barn fence. The crow flew off in, I thought at the time, indignation. Crows are the smartest birds. I didn't think about that. Everything else living I hit, grasshoppers, lizards, small birds, gave me little pleasure. I was proud of my aim, but what I, where I felt, what, what I felt whenever I went to admire my handiwork was emptiness. One summer, my father confiscated my BB gun. I deserved it. I had hiked to the top of our hill with my sister Amy and her friend Jamie, if you guys know the little Britons in town. I took my BB gun along, probably to see Manly. The view from the top of our hill is stunning. One can see Mount Hood, a picture postcard mountain that is so perfectly looking the way a mountain should look, it doesn't seem possible. 
To the north, many miles of the Columbia River carve an enormous Z with an elongated base. When I was in the third grade, I thought the Columbia River looked like the Z on my Zips tennis shoes. I made the hike often to stand on the top of my world and take it in. When I visit the top of the hill now, I can't help but measure with my eye where the Missoula floods are said to have reached it in the last ice age, starting about 15,000 years ago. A temporary lake called Lake Missoula formed repeatedly in Montana, 400 miles to the northeast. Lake Missoula filled with glacial runoff bounded by walls of ice. Each 50 years, my lifetime, depending, Lake Missoula filled to hold as much water as Lakes Erie and Ontario combined. The lake would become so full that the water pressure itself was enough to melt the base of the ice dams that held the water back. Downriver lies the Dalles. When the ice dams broke, Lake Missoula was emptied of all its water in a few days. There's only one way for the water to go to reach the sea, the narrow Columbia Gorge. My sister Amy is a state trooper detective in Oregon now. If she had been patrolling I-84 at the end of the Ice Age, her radar gun could have clocked floodwaters rushing past at 80 miles an hour. My math is correct. The floodwaters filled the entire gorge. Our hill, which is Cirrhosis Hill, our hill became an island in the torrent. This happened at least 70 and perhaps 100 times in a row. When the floods were the highest, every thousand years or, or so, our hill was engulfed by 300 feet of water and mud. Anyone unfortunate enough to have settled in the Dalles was wiped from history. The water swallowed up our hill and dumped sand and a granite boulder from who knows where on top. 15,000 years later, the sand lies at the crest of our hill above the native bedrock and beneath the dry grass and scrub oak. Jamie wore tight designer jeans on our hike to the top of the hill. I don't know how much work it takes to slip into jeans that tight, but Jamie had put in the effort. She had the big hair of the 1980s with mile high bangs. Those are her words. Her lips shone with the bomb that came in the brass tin with a sliding lid. All the cool, cool girls had one. Jamie came from the part of town with the nice houses. I thought she was a little bit stuck up. At one point as we climbed the hill, Jamie bent over in front of me. I can't recall why she bent over to look more closely into a hole in case a snake was inside. What I recall clearly as I lie on the CT scanner following orders is the sight of Jamie's buttocks in her too tight jeans presenting themselves to me as a perfect target. I don't know why I did it. In one impulsive motion, I lifted my BB gun and shot Jamie in the behind. I felt awful. I felt awful immediately, not only because I knew I would get in trouble, as I did. I couldn't believe I had acted on impulse. I have seldom been impulsive, before or since. I didn't find where my dad hid my BB gun until I returned home from college a married man. In the CT scanner, it would be a poor time to laugh. I hold my breath and lie as still as I can. The CT scanner is a donut, taller than I am. I had lain down on the scanner table and dropped my jeans to keep the metal zipper and belt buckle from blocking the x-rays. I hold still and order, not because the voice of command cows me, but because I want the scan to be clear and any BB-sized tumors visible. The x-ray source whirls in the donut about me. The table where I lie extracts me slowly from the donut. The x-rays scan me from collarbone to pelvis. In six seconds, I receive a year's worth of radiation. Breathe, says the CT scanner. The recording's a little less demanding this time. Perhaps the voice actor knew we wouldn't need an order to breathe. We only need permission. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
I think this is the last, last call for anything. If somebody wants to get something to eat, this is this is it. We can do some Q&A, and I have one more thing I'd like to read um, before the end, then we can do, we can do sign-in. Right, sitting there? OK. Yes. <laughs> My mom has a question. <laughs> Please, Diane. Yeah. yeah. Let me repeat it so everybody can hear. So two things came to mind. One was Jerry Brown, uh, that uh, I mentioned because of Jeopardy. Go ahead. So the other question was, had I read My Handmaid's Life by Carol Anderson? I have, I'll answer the second one because it's easy. I have not. Yeah, Jerry Bant, I have a problem as a writer is, I have seven kids and to keep those names straight is far more than enough for a, a reader. So I had to keep the names as little as possible. Jerry Brown was one of the names that I, that hurt me the most not to put in the book, I have to be honest. I was, so those of you who don't know, Jerry Brown um, and, and uh, his wife, they were actually really pretty instrumental in, in trivia for me in life. Um, uh, is her name Verna? Verna. So Verna Brown was uh, the librarian in middle school, and she would give me Games Magazine that Jerry had already written on with his pencil and uh, kind of erased. And Games Magazine, very hard kind of trivia and games and crossword puzzles and stuff like that and also kind of introduced me to some of the trivia things. And then Jerry had, as a, as a history teacher, not only was a great history teacher, but had trivia at lunchtime, which was just a revelation for me. And then and that, that was the team that, that I joined. I was uh, in the, what we called the chat and chew, or the scarf and barf, for those that, you know, <laughs> the, the place where we would eat lunch. Um, uh, during a break period where Jerry Brown was also just the kind of the person babysitting us during a break. I don't know why I took a break period, but I took a break period. So I was there with him as he stood up and then sat down very suddenly on, uh, you know, on the ground and pushed away the, 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 uh, the, the cafeteria table. And I do remember as he had walked in the door of the chat and chew, he went like that on his foot and was kind of looking back at his foot. And then when he was on the ground, he just was taking his right, I think it was his right hand, and hitting his left leg over and over again. And I went up and talked to him, and I said, what's wrong? And he said, oh, I think I've had a stroke. And he had, right there in front of me. Mm -hmm. and that, yeah, so, and, uh, and then he had the second stroke that, that took his ability to speak. And to, I think to understand language, too, which just strikes me as being just awful for somebody as, you know, as smart and as, uh, and, and as good a man as it's honestly. Yeah. I did, I couldn't tell. I, uh, that's good that he could. I just, I didn't know. He did, because he played peanut but sometimes No he, way. Sometimes he gets suits mixed up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, you could beat him then. You just cheat. <laughs> So I'm sorry, there's a long, a, a long answer to a short question on Jerry Brown, but yeah, yeah I just certainly do. I think maybe one or two more questions and then I'll go into uh, I have one more, a little bit of reading, then we do some signing. Okay, we can do some more reading then. Just a little bit more. I'll just actually end with the things that I started the book with, not the things that I ended the book with. So the reason that I started, you know, in the, in the book, as, as I said, was really to give advice to my kids. If you think this advice is just not for you, it's for my kids, so sorry. So some pieces in here and some explanation for each of them, I guess. When we get why we kick the dog, we don't kick the dog. That sounds weird when I say it that way, I think, but I'm sure, but when we get why we kick the dog, we don't kick the dog. What I try to teach my kids is that if we understand why we did something that was, we feel wasn't the right thing to do, if we really understand why we did it, then sometimes we find a better way to get what we want. We do things at times, I know I do, possibly you do or possibly you've seen others do it we do things that are not the best but we get something out of it we 
we do it because we got something out of it. Is it the best way to get something out of it? No, it is not the best way to get something out of it. We're, you know, cruel in some way because we need someone to pay attention to us. That's just an example. Once we realize that, then we don't kick the dog because we get a, we get what we need a better way. And I try to uh, try to help them. One of the things that I, I, I do try to impress upon my kids is that life's greatest joys are found in friends and family. So thank you for coming. But so are life's greatest sorrows. That's the price we pay. Loss is the price of joy. It's worth the price, but it is a hard price. Something I try to teach my kids, because it's, I think this is common in a lot of religious communities, ours definitely is like high demand religions often extract a price of worrying that you're just not doing things right. And some things, some habits especially, are hard to kick. And people will tend to go, you know, they say like, your favorite sin or something like that. You keep trying to do the same thing over and over and over again, and you just keep failing and failing and failing and failing. You keep trying to climb up the cliff and you fall down the cliff. You climb up the cliff and you fall down the cliff over and over and over again. And what I try to tell my kids is stop. It may be that there's a handhold up there that you need to grow two inches to be able to reach, and it doesn't matter how often you climb this cliff until you grow. That cliff might as well be the moon. You cannot climb it now. That's not a failure. It's just you're not ready to. You can't do it. Or maybe the way you're going up is a stupid way, and you don't see it. Maybe you need to have some ropes. Maybe there's a different way up. Just let go of it for now. Do something else. Find something else that you can do and another cliff to climb, not this one. Come back later. It'll still be there. And you know what? Maybe you'll find that you've just grown around it. I find that true in my own life, and I try to um, uh, try to uh, help my kids to do this. I'll leave with just two more. Maybe not just two more. <laughs> it can always be Christmas. Have you ever noticed at Christmas? Maybe maybe you don't. So if you don't, I'm sorry. I'm sorry in multiple ways. But at Christmas, I feel fantastic. I just I like it. I like the. I just like how I feel. I feel good walking around, even though it's cold, you know, I, I feel like it's Christmas. It's a nice time, it's a nice time to be with people. Why don't we feel good for 11 other months of the year? Why is it only December that we feel good? One year, we had the Christmas tree up, and I just left it up in January and left it up in February. We left that tree up the entire year. I thought it was great. We can keep Christmas with us, or whichever, um, whichever holiday it means similarly to you. We can keep Christmas around us like a bubble. Every day can be Christmas, if we want it to be. There are a couple of things that I tell my kids in kind of hard times. This is especially true these days when some of the hard times seem so big. You can do. Worry about that. Don't worry about the things you can't do. You can't do them. That helps people, helps me, I hope it helps them, focus on the things that they can do and not get themselves just worried about something they can't solve. This is a problem, by the way, if you have a ginormous ego and you think that you can solve diseases by thinking about them and like, say you. <laughs> but I do try to teach people, you know, teach my kids. Find what you actually can solve, solve that. Help it with that thing. And the flip side of that is when people say, and I hear this from good, good people, people that have the ability to influence and to do uh, power. Why is this such, a, why is this happening now? Why is it so horrible what's happening at any one time? I love I love it. I love the show The Dad's Latest Catch. I just do. I, I love it. the one where they're up in the you know they're up and they're in Alaska and they have the, the fishing boats and they're uh, they're crab fishing and it's horrible. It is a horrible job. It is a terrible terrible job. You do not want to be a crab fisherman. But I have noticed one guy who was a horrible person also. He thinks he's 
best person out there. He's the best captain, and he will just, I don't know if he does it with the cameras, or if he does this every time in life, he does it every time in life, but I don't know. He screws over everybody. Promises to do one thing, does the opposite. You know, takes their pods or, you know, takes their, their place. He's horrible until times are really tough. Then he's just becomes really humble and is really good at what he's doing. He becomes a good person when times are tough. What I tell my kids for something like this, when things seem so big that, like, why, why is this happening now? There are no heroes without horrors. The horrors make the heroes. If, if you can fight something that's really hard, what if you never had anything hard to fight? Your courage, your intelligence, your strength would be worthless. It would be nothing. The hard times make for heroic people. And I'll leave you with one last thing. My kids are smart. They are. They are smart kids. I love how smart my kids are. Some, I wouldn't say all. Maybe they all are. They're all, they're all very good looking. No, so I have smart, good looking kids. Just trust me. I'm smart. I do try to teach them. It's nice to be smart. It's a nice sunny day. It's nice to be smart. It is nice to be attractive. It's nice. But none of that matters if you aren't kind. Kindness, at the end of the day, is all that matters. So thank you. I'm gonna go over there to sign. I'm going to sign over there, just so that we don't, you know, so have them, and I'm happy to talk to people. Uh, I'll stay as long as they, you know, until they take me So thank you. Thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it.